Hello, my name is Nick Lapham and welcome to this video on altimetry. Altimetry is a relatively difficult subject to master and it's worth putting some work into it because you will encounter this topic in four of the ATPL subjects, meteorology, general navigation, instrumentation and flight planning. I've structured this video around three of the Q codes, QFE, QNH and QFF, all of which are important concepts to grasp. I'll also direct some attention towards understanding altimeter errors, which is an area that we see a lot of questions being directed. Let's start right from the beginning with understanding pressure altimeters and what they do. Here is a diagram of a basic altimeter. In reality, they are much more complicated than this. For the sake of the video, I just want you to appreciate the concept. A standard altimeter contains an aneroid capsule this capsule will expand and contract based on the static pressure experienced inside the casing of the altimeter. When the aircraft is at low elevation, the weight of the atmosphere should be quite heavy and should put pressure on the walls of the capsule, forcing it to contract. In the reverse sense, as the aircraft climbs higher into the atmosphere, where the ambient pressure is lower, the capsule will naturally expand outwards. As it does so, it is connected by a number of linkages that translate the amount of expansion or contraction into an indication of altitude or height, as compared to a certain point in the atmosphere, which is typically sea level. It would be great if the pressure at sea level always remained the same so that we could have a single static datum to compare to. Unfortunately, this is not the case, and therefore altimeters need a way to change the reference point which you can see in the diagram labeled as subscale control. Any changes to this control will be reflected in something called the Colesman window. It's important that you understand that a pressure altimeter works by making comparisons. It will make a comparison between the ambient pressure that it's detecting versus the location of the pressure level that you have selected. I'm going to show you a few diagrams to help you make sense of that. Just keep in mind that the pressure that you are selecting in the Colesman window is the pressure level that you wanted to read zero at. If you're hoping to avoid obstacles in the vicinity of an airport, the tops of these obstacles are usually mapped relative to sea level. Therefore, you want your altimeter to read zero at sea level so you can compare your position to that of the obstacles. Here we have a fictional environment that I have devised with an airfield located above sea level and a fairly tall mountain off in the distance. If we wanted to find out what the elevation of the airport was, how would this be done? Well, in the real world, this kind of survey would be done by a team of experts with some impressively complicated kit. I'm going to drastically oversimplify it. The aviation world around us is mapped according to the International Standard Atmosphere, or ISA. ISA has applications well beyond aviation, but it is a very important subject for pilots. Within the international standard atmosphere, sea level pressure is considered to be 1013.25 hectopascals, or 29.92 inches of mercury. According to the international standard atmosphere, pressure falls off in the lower layers of the atmosphere at a rate of 27 feet per millibar, or hectopascal. As you go higher up into the atmosphere, the pressure lapse rate diminishes down to as little as 200 feet per hectopascal. These days, we use a figure of 30 for simplicity's sake, and that's what I will be using for the rest of the exercise. This means that if my pressure starts at sea level at 1013 hectopascals, if I went 30 feet higher, the pressure should fall off by one hectopascal. Let's repeat this process again and again. And there you have the elevation of our field, mapped out at 90 feet above mean sea level. I'll continue putting in the pressure planes above the airfield, and this gives us an elevation for the top of the mountain at 210 feet. Hardly a mountain, I know, but this is an oversimplification for the sake of the exercise. Now from this image, we have the benefit of seeing the full picture of all of the pressure planes, which we obviously wouldn't have in the real world. Imagine that a meteorologist at the airfield walks outside and measures the atmospheric pressure at the airfield reference point. 
it will be 1010 hectopascals. And this brings us on to our first definition, QFE. QFE is quite simply the atmospheric pressure at aerodrome elevation or at runway threshold. Think of the FE as standing for fixed elevation. Now QFE is the most fundamental of the Q codes associated with altimetry. It's the most fundamental that we'll be looking at since the others are derived from the QFE. From this point, let's retrace our steps a little bit. Imagine if we didn't know all of this. Let's say that we, we have captured the atmospheric pressure at the airfield and we knew the airfield elevation. Then based on our knowledge of the international standard atmosphere, we could work backwards to calculate what the pressure would be at sea level. If we went down 30 feet, we would find the 1011 level, then the 1012 level, and finally the 1013 level at sea level. This would bring us to our second definition, QNH. QNH is the QFE mathematically adjusted down to sea level using the ISA lapse rate. I'll fill in the rest of the atmosphere for good measure. Now let's introduce an altimeter into the picture. It is worth noting that in a perfect ISA atmosphere, which would be unthinkably rare, our altimeter will do exactly what it's supposed to, ignoring any problems with the instrument itself. Returning to what I said previously, the pressure datum that we will input into the Colesman window is the place that we want it to read zero. Our altimeter is then going to make comparisons between the pressure level that you want it to read zero at and the pressure that it is detecting. In this case, if I told the altimeter to read zero at the 1010 pressure level and the ambient pressure was 1010, it would tell me there's no difference, so it would read zero. If we change the subscale setting to the QNH, we are saying that we want our altimeter to read zero at the pressure level of 1013, which also happens to be our sea level reading. If our altimeter is currently detecting a static pressure of 1010, it will be detecting a difference of three hectopascals between these pressure levels. Three hectopascal difference multiplied by 30 feet per hectopascal equals 90 feet. This shows us that if we set the QNH on our altimeter, it will read field elevation. Let's now suppose that if we keep the datum fixed at 1013 and move the aircraft upwards to a place where the ambient pressure is lower. In the Colesman window, we have said that we want it to read zero at the pressure level of 1013, and it is detecting a static pressure of 1006. This is a seven hectopascal difference. Seven multiplied by 30 equals 210 feet. What we have covered so far is the way that altimeters are supposed to work in a perfect world. Unfortunately, this is rarely the case, and we have to consider the limitations of these devices. The first types of error to consider are pressure errors. It would be great to live in a perfect ISA world, we know that this is seldom the case because our world is a very dynamic place and the atmospheric pressure is going to change from day to day. So our altimeter is going to be affected by non-standard pressures. This means that the pressure at sea level may not be 1013 hectopascals. So let's just say that the pressure at our airfield dropped, say to 1007 hectopascals. Look at where the 1007 level is right now. Let's bring the 1007 hectopascal pressure plane downwards to our airfield elevation. This becomes our new QFE. Let's rebuild the rest of our atmosphere. If we count down 30 feet, we get to our next pressure, pressure plane, which will be 1008. And if we continue that on, we eventually get to our QNH, which is now 1010 which is what our QFE previously was. So our pressure planes have effectively shifted 90 feet downwards. 
I'm going to continue downwards from there. Notice where the 1013 level is now. With an aircraft parked at the airfield, imagine if we left 1013 on the subscale. We would be telling our altimeter that we wanted it to read zero at the 1013 level, which in this scenario is now way down at the bottom of the diagram. Your altimeter is detecting 1007 at the airfield, and hence it is detecting a difference of 6 hectopascals. If we multiply 6 by 30, then the altimeter would be reading 180 feet. Going back to the original scenario, imagine if the pilot forgets to adjust the altimeter setting and the aircraft takes off and tries to fly over the mountain with the subscale still set to 1013. Your altimeter is reading a difference between 1013 and 1006, a difference of 7 hectopascals, which means your altimeter is reading 210 feet. It should only be reading 120 feet at this point. You can see why this would be dangerous. The pilot is being given a false confidence. They think they should be reaching the height of the peak, but in terms of their true altitude, they still have a lot of mountain to clear. Going back to the original scenario, the pilot needs to adjust the altimeter setting to the Q&H to obtain the correct reading at the airfield. So we need to correct this by changing the figure in the Colesman window to 1010 and that will restore our altimeter to the required reading of 90 feet. Let's move on to temperature errors. Going back to our ISA atmosphere, we had our pressure planes layered out 30 feet apart. And we now understand that our altimeter is prone to misread on account of non-standard pressures. It is also prone to misread on account of non-standard temperatures. What a non-standard temperature profile does is change the pressure lapse rate so that the pressure falls off faster or slower than the ISA lapse rate, depending on if the air is warm or cold. The diagram, this diagram shows the what the atmosphere would look like in colder than ISA conditions where the pressure falls off quicker with height. You can see now the spacing between the pressure planes is now 23 feet instead of 30. Keep in mind that I'm exaggerating all of these figures for the sake of the exercise. Here is a side-by-side -side view of our two different atmospheres. You can see that at airfield level, the pressure is one hectopascal lower in the colder atmosphere than it is in the icer atmosphere. What I'm going to do now is introduce a new Q code called the QFF. Both the QNH and the QFF are derived from a QFE, so that is our starting point. Let's imagine that we had a QFE of 1009 hectopascals. Going down in steps of 30 feet, this would put our QNH at about 1012 hectopascals. This brings me on to explaining that the QFF is the QFE adjusted down to mean sea level using the environmental pressure lapse rate. So instead of using the standard rates, the meteorologists will take measurements to determine how the pressure is actually reducing with height. In this case, I've used figures of 23 feet per hectopascal. For good measure, let's fill in the rest of our atmosphere. Now here we have an aircraft parked at the airfield with the Q&H of 1012 set on the altimeter. The altimeter is reflecting 90 feet as the difference between the Q&H and the QFE is 3 hectopascals using 30 feet per hectopascal. This is where things become slightly complicated because I'm going to include another altimeter reading. The top box is showing indicated altitude, which is what the pilot will be seeing on the flight deck. The second box will be showing true altitude, which will be the altitude that the aircraft is actually at. At this stage, the indicated altitude and the true altitude are exactly the same because the aircraft is parked at the position where the QFE was originally measured. We don't need to consider any temperature errors here because our altimeter, which works on 30 feet per hectopascal, is in complete agreement with the Q&H, which is also derived 
using 30 feet per hectopascal. The moment we move away from the QFE, whether that be up or down, we will start to see the effect of temperature errors. Imagine that this aircraft takes off and climbs up to a point in the atmosphere where the atmospheric pressure is 1005 hectopascals. According to the altimeter in the aircraft, which is calibrated to ISA and thinks that every 1 hectopascal drop in pressure is equal to 30 feet, if this is the case, the altimeter will believe that it is at 210 feet because it expects to find the 1005 hectopascal level at the peak of the mountain. The problem is that in the real atmosphere, because pressure has fallen off quicker than the ISA rate, the aircraft meets the 1005 pressure level much lower. This is clearly a dangerous scenario because the aircraft is being given a false sense of security. A common mistake for students is to believe that using the QFF solves this problem because it considers the actual pressure lapse rate, but in fact it doesn't, and I'll show you why. If we adjust the setting on our altimeter to the QFF of 1013, we increase the altimeter's perceived distance between the 1005 pressure level, which is the ambient pressure it is currently experiencing, and the 1013 pressure level. There is a difference of 8 hectopascals, which multiplied by 30 feet per hectopascal means the altimeter will read 240 feet. So what this has done is actually made the problem worse. You might then be asking, what use is the QFF? And the short answer is that it isn't particularly useful in everyday flying. If we were flying in an amphibious aircraft and we took off from the airfield with the aim of landing on the sea, if we set the Q&H on our altimeter, this means that our altimeter expects to read zero when experiencing an ambient pressure of 1012. You'll notice on the diagram that this pressure level is not at sea level, and so your altimeter would be reading zero whilst you were still hovering somewhere above the water. In which case, if you set the QFF on the altimeter, then your altimeter would read zero upon reaching the 1013 level on landing. As a summary, I want to draw your attention to how the pressure planes change within an atmosphere that is colder than ISA. Take note of how the error propagates either side of the QFE. Keep in mind that this error will create the reverse problem in an atmosphere that is warmer than ISA. And that brings me to the end of this video. I hope you now have a better overall picture of how the altimeter is working. Look out for other videos on our channel that deal with sample questions, correcting for pressure and temperature errors. And that's all from me. See you in the next one.